It's my, my real pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Julius DeWald, a dear old friend of mine from way back when. And um, Jules has a, a, a bachelor's degree in physical therapy from the Free University of Brussels in Belgium and a PhD in physiology, neurophysiology, from Loma Linda University in California. Um, he came to the Chicago area when I was a graduate student and we worked together uh, for several years there. Um, he finished, he did a lot of his, uh, his PhD research at, at the Rehab Institute of Chicago. He's now, after moving up the ladder, he's the chair of physical therapy and human movement sciences at Northwestern University and really the world's expert on understanding the discoordination that happens following stroke. So we're really uh, privileged to have you here today, Jules, so please. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? Good, thanks, you. thanks Bob. Uh, indeed, uh, we go back a long way. Did a lot of uh, biceps training together over the years. <laughs> and uh, had, a, had a great time stimulating our biceps muscles on robots and stuff, uh, pulling Bob out of a chair almost. I'm sure you remember Bob. <laughs> and uh, anyways, great time. Also wanted to thank Matt Williams for organizing this really great, uh, great tour. I haven't been back here for quite some time. Um, been back here about a year and a half, two years ago to see my son Hendrik, who took me around in the VA. But that was uh, kind of the extent of it. So I'm really happy to be back. I think that there's a lot of analogies between what's happening in CASE and what's happening at Northwestern. Uh, really more systems engineering, system approaches, and really doing things that, at the end of the day, will make a clinical, uh, clinical, clinical difference. Um, so I think um, uh, we, we're very similar. And one of the reasons I'm here today is to potentially explore p uh, co collaborations between us. So without further ado, let me kind of switch gears a bit and talk uh, about uh, uh, our department a little bit and then what uh, the main talk topic is today and that is uh, motor impairments following unilateral brain lesions in adults mostly, although we've done the last eight years a lot of work in, in kids with cerebral palsy as well. So this is the, the place we're, we're located and uh, this is the building we're at right at Michigan Avenue. This is my office with my head cut off. So this is where I'm at, and great view of the northern part of Michigan Avenue. We currently, when I became chair about 12 years ago, we had two floors in the building. We now have three and a quarter floor in the building. So we're growing very rapidly. New labs, new faculty. I'm growing a large imaging group with people with physics and engineering backgrounds within our departments in collaboration with biomedical engineering and with radiology, uh, which is a lot of fun as well. Um, Good. Uh, very quickly, uh, what we do is we train doctors in physical therapy. We're the oldest physical therapy program in the, in the nation. Our first year graduated in 1928, so it's been a while. And currently we have uh, basically a class size of 90 to 95 students a year that ultimately after three years, two years classroom, one year clinical rotation, become doctors in physical therapy. That's the entry level for PT now. There is no undergrad degree. There's no master's degree, everybody gets a doctoral degree. In addition to the DPT program, we have a PhD of neuroscience at Northwestern, has been around for a long time, but about 10 to 11 years ago, in collaboration with my colleague C.J. Heckman, we created a specialization in the neuroscience program called Movement and Rehabilitation Sciences. So these are folks that are more interested in systems neuroscience work. And as you know, even in biomedical engineering, there's a big trend to go tissue and to go some molecular, but this is an attempt to kind of keep the systems neuroscience going at a place like Northwestern. In addition to that, something I'm most proud of is we started the dual degree now about 12 years ago, which combines a PhD in engineering. So these are all engineering students that come in, do a PhD in biomedical, mechanical, or electroengineering computer science, and combine that in an eight-year period with a doctoral degree in physical therapy. So in the end, they are bona fide PhDs in engineering, but they're also doctors in physical therapy, so they are perfectly bilingual. I have an accent in my engineering. I do pretty okay at the biology side. Uh, and then you have engineers that are really good in the engineering side and have a significant accent in the, in, at the bi biology side of things. These folks are purely bilingual, okay? They do really well in both teams. And these folks have been th hotly th uh, thought after. We have like five grads right now. Three of them already have faculty positions. Has been quite a success. And I think... Uh, the success is also measured in the fact that colleagues start to imitate you. So we have the University of Pittsburgh doing this right now, as well as Emory slash Georgia Tech are doing this. But just with BME, not with ME and EECS. 
Good topic today. I wanted to talk about neural mechanisms and treatment of motor impairments following unilateral brain injury. Again, I'll concentrate more on adults. And I want to talk about smart use of, uh, of uh, rehab or therapeutic devices. So what is it that you see clinically after unilateral brain lesion? Well, the first thing you see is hemiparesis or weakness at the site opposite of where the lesion takes place in the brain. Another thing that we are really well known for is you get an abnormal drive from the brain that results in an inability to drive one joint at a time. For instance, if a stroke subject lifts up their arm, they also flex their elbow, wrist, and fingers, something you and I don't need to do. So their independent joint control is really seriously impacted, which has all kinds of, of uh, functional uh, implications, as I'll show you. We also make get abnormal stretch reflexes as to... Uh, you know, spasticity, I'm sure you're familiar with that. A lot of folks here do work in spinal cord injury. It's an issue there as well. But how important this actually is during movement is not entirely clear, and I'll get into that a bit. And I'll try to convince you that it may not be that important at all. Okay? And then last but not least, we always talk about the brain and how the brain controls movement, but we tend to forget the peripheral system. So what happens to muscle? What happens to muscle if it's driven differently? Is muscle stiffness going to change? Are muscle properties going to change or not? So we'll have a bit of that uh, as well, with some rather surprising findings, as I'll show you. So in the end, uh, I want to uh, make a case that effectively measuring and understanding, treating these imp impairment will result in better functional use of the upper. And I mentioned a bit of work on lower extremity as well, since I had the pleasure to talk to a few investigators working with Ron Triolo, who do lower extremity work also in stroke. And that we need devices that can sense and potentially change movement environments to in, in, increase our understanding of mechanisms that actually underlay these impairments as a start, <clears throat> as opposed to building a device already without really knowing what it is that we need to treat. So what is the current area in robotics? I'll concentrate on that, and I'll bring in FES, given uh, that, that uh, you, uh, you all are, are really, really strong at that, uh, to also talk a bit at that side of the story. So basically, what is current robotics doing is basically um, uh, replicating what physical therapists are doing. I'm a physical therapist, I have no clue what I'm doing. That's why I did a PhD, because a lot of what we do is very anecdotal. It's not really understood. Often assist movements, promote interventions without good scientific underpinning, and really the big thing in neurorehabilitation, if you go to these types of meetings, is repetition is what it's all about. Nobody talks about repetition of what and why. It just do a lot of it, you get better. So it's a very linear, primitive way of thinking. Okay? Plus, the robotic devices, for sure, FES is uh, much cheaper, but these robotic devices are very expensive. The, 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 the cheapest devices that are pretty passive are already around $70,000. Okay, and then it's a device that may or may not really do what, it's, what, what it should be doing. So very expensive, and consequently, enthusiasm by clinicians is not particularly high. Okay? So I want to make a case of robotics and smart use of robotics and FES in novel ways to treat these actual impairments that I just... Uh, talked about. So the first impairment I'd like to talk about where we have done most of our work is again this loss of independent joint control that clinicians call synergies or limb synergies. And in the upper extremity it means if you lift up your arm and you drive your shoulder abductors, you also drive your elbow, wrist and finger flexors. Okay? You end up what I always call jokingly in the Schwarzenegger posture. Okay? You have this type of uh, position. Doesn't mean you cannot extend, you can extend, but you tend to couple that by pushing the arm down. And without showing you any slides, a lot of my earlier work that uh, I know uh, a number of, uh, quite a number of you are familiar with, has shown that under isometric conditions, we found that the more you lift up, the less you can extend your elbow. Because as you're lifting up, you're coupling with flexors at the elbow, wrist, and fingers, and your ability, therefore, to generate a net elbow extension or to extend your fingers becomes significantly compromised. This was all static work, but uh, we want to do dynamics, right? So, Basically, about 15 years or so ago, I talked to uh, one of my uh, uh, Dutch uh, now friends, Wim Lam, who was a really good controls engineer, actually invented the controls uh, algorithms for admittance control at the time, uh, using analog uh, approaches in the Netherlands, in Fokker, uh, which is also the, uh, the then uh, aviation uh, industry uh, airplane manufacturer, and basically uh, started to talk to him about the use of the haptic master, which I've seen here, that case as well. The only thing is that we have a haptic master here that, as you know, can go up and down. This tube can move in and out over the support piece and it can rotate. But we added instead of the three degree freedom load cell, a six degree freedom load cell, and a gimbal 
that is instrumented. So you can see that we can actually support the form of this individual. We have it set up with a parallelogram so that the position of the load cell is always uh, determined. And basically what we can do with this is create virtual environments for people to move in from a mechanical perspective. So I can recreate a table. I can have you move your arm over the table, but the, arm, the table will be frictionless. So you can slide over it like you slide over a piece of, of ice, right? Or I can measure the weight of your limb, fully support the weight of your limb while you're moving two targets in the workspace. So it kind of feels like you're in space. Or I can make your arm progressively heavier up to the limb, limb weight, or more importantly to Bob and I to deal with more than the limb weight, but also the big German stein that we'd like to move in the workspace, right? So that's the real world. It's not just moving your arm. It's moving objects in the workspace. That means that you have to deal with not just the weight of your limb, but beyond the weight of the limb. All of that we can simulate with this really nice admittance control system. And with this system, we can bring the inertial perception to the subject down to about four or five kilograms. Okay, Not great, but uh, much better than impedance control type uh, robotics. So great environment to start to study this loss of independent joint control. So what I'm going to show you in a moment is what happens if I ask a person to slowly move in clockwise or counterclockwise way as far out as they can. And we'll do that with the arm fully supported on the haptic table, no friction. Or floating in space, do the same thing, or lifting the weight of the limb or beyond and see what that does to their workspace. Okay? So I'll show you a little, little video here. So here you see a moderately severely impaired individual on the haptic table. And if you look uh, carefully, their workspace is really, really good. R the, re the red band is as far as this person can move based on the segment length of his, uh, his arm. So you can su see, although he's moderately severely impaired, if supported, he has a really nice workspace. Now he's floating in space. You can see the arm kind of bobbing up and down a bit. And you can see he gets to be going out uh, as far as kind of what you saw before. He does almost as well, if not as well, as before because I deal with the total weight of the limb. Okay? So he can move up and down, but his work area here is actually uh, pretty well preserved under those conditions. So the next condition you'll see in a moment, so this is zero active support by the individual. Now the person has to do all the work, lift up the weight of the limb, and they don't get nearly as close to the red band as before. They're really struggling to get the arm out there. So basically what we have been finding, I'm summarizing work that uh, Theresa Sugol Moulton has done in the time for her PhD, uh, and actually she's our first dual degree student. And you can see that from table to two times limb weight, the work area and control subjects really do not change. I mean, I can take pretty much anybody in, your, in the room here and have you go to four or five times limb weight. You still do well. Okay? But this is what we saw in stroke. Moderate to severely impaired stroke, they have the largest work area when the arm is fully supported on the haptic table, but as we make the limb heavier, two times limb weight, they barely can get their hand away from their chest. Because as they're lifting up, they're coupling with flexors, and therefore their ability to reach becomes significantly compromised. Okay. Good. Um, going to the hand. <clears throat> the hand is uh, often studied in isolation, but we wanted to see what shoulder abduction, the lifting up, does not only to reaching, but also to the ability to open the hand. So this is work done by uh, uh, Yun Lan, who uh, finished his PhD in, in uh, December uh, 2017, who instrumented the fingertips, used the optotract here, plus we had this nice little cylindrical piece with a pressure mat, high resolution pressure mat on it, so we can measure pressures that uh, occur uh, while relaxed or lifting up, and to get an idea as to whether hand opening and, and force control get changed as a function of shoulder abduction loading. Okay? And so basically, here you see um, uh, the kinematics of hand opening, and one little metric that he developed, which I thought was really ingenious, as opposed to looking at all joint angle and getting really fancy, is to simply connect the, four, the, the five digits and make a pentagon area, and see how the pentagon area changes. So the pentagon area is largest when the hand is flat. That's what we normalize it to. And the less you can open the hand, the smaller the pentagon area becomes. And the smallest it will get is kind of the opening you have while the hand is holding the cylindrical piece. And so one thing we observed is that when you do this with the arm supported, lifting up 25% of lifting up 50% of max of each individual, that in the really severe individuals, it made no difference. They cannot open their hand no matter what you do. Their hand is always in the flex posture. 
moderately impaired individual, and those of you who have a bit of an idea of Fugelmeyer, which is a, an impairment score, highest score is 66, lowest score obviously is zero. So if you have folks that are in the range of 25 to around 40, 45 on 66, um, you basically find that folks can indeed open their hand on the table, but that the opening becomes more and more compromised as you lift up greater levels from table to 50% of max. Whereas in us control subjects, it really makes no difference. Okay? So again, you cannot look at the hand in isolation. You need to know what happens at these more proximal joints. If you're thinking about FES, or if you think about robotics, and I think FES is really the way to go uh, for many reasons, then you need to know the relationship between what you do at your shoulder and what that may do at wrists and fingers. What happens with regard to force control? Well, if we measure with the pressure map and we ask the person to lift up more, we found out that particularly in the severe and less so in the moderate, the more you lift up, the more you get this involuntary grasping at the hand. Okay? So it's something else to keep in mind because if they want to, let's say, hold a, a glass uh, of, 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 of thin uh, crystal and they lift up their arm, they could squeeze that whole, whole glass to pieces, literally, and they have no control over that. The max torques, whether you have the synergies included or not, are the same. The only thing is that part of that lower end control of forces is, is dictated by what you do at the shoulder. So another thing to, to keep in mind with regard to potential uh, neuroprosthetic approaches in, in, in stroke. And you can see it's even more significant in more impaired than in moderately impaired, and it becomes uh, pretty much inexistent in control subject. None of these values are different from, from zero. So going back to, to the work that has been done here in a more distant past by John Shea, who had done some nice implanted um, uh, approaches uh, using your great implanted system, and studied this and basically said that you, he could get the hand to open, but he had some conditions in his paper. It works well with the arm upper limb in a resting position, wrist and forearm supported, and please, no voluntary effort, because otherwise it wouldn't work. So, that doesn't mean that FES doesn't work, but we need to know this relationship I just showed you before we know how to drive these, uh, these muscles. Good. Well, it's nice to show you these behaviors, but you know, I'm, 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 I'm a motor control neuroscientist uh, as well, and I want to understand why we have this also. I think that understanding the underlying mechanisms may allow us to further improve the way we, we can attack this problem. So one of the potential reasons for this loss of independent joint control is an increase dependent on brainstem motor pathways, which we all have. We have cortical spinal pathways, high resolution systems that control the hands, but we also have bulbospinal spinal pathways that we tend to use much more for, more for posture and balance. So neck control, trim control, etc., often is, is, is activated via brainstem pathways like reticulospinal, vestibulospinal pathways, etc. So we may have some of this. We may also have possible reorganization of motor cortices. And we published a few papers showing that since there's less cortical area to work with, you indeed get greater overlap for different, different moments you generate at different joints in people with a stroke uh, versus uh, you or me. So what have we done to try to understand what happens at the brain? I'm giving you uh, a, a quick story of work done by Albert Chen, who came to us with a master's uh, in electrical engineering from Stanford and whose grandpa had a stroke and was really fascinated to try to study stroke. So what Albert did in collaboration with Jun Zhao and myself is in essence look at brain activity in individuals with stroke using a 160 channel high density array on the head as well as using a bounty element model to look at individuals heads. So we had MRIs of each individual, we built subject specific head models, uh, we know the, the capacitance and, and impedances of the skin, the skull and the subarachnoid regions and then basically uh, could then explain the deterioration of the signals that we get at the scalp. So knowing that, knowing the shape of the head, we could do an inverse solution and come up with a much better resolution at the cortex than what we started with at the scalp. So we went from a resolution at the scalp of about a centimeter and a half to only cortex in the order of about three to five millimeters, which is good enough to pick apart a shoulder and an elbow and a hand. It's not good enough to pick apart individual fingers. Uh, what's nice about EEG as opposed to uh, bold MR or functional MR is that the time resolution is in the millisecond range. So that means if somebody does a reaching motion, I can see when that starts, and I can go back 100 milliseconds in time and see what motor commands were sent from the brain to the spinal cord, something I could never do in both MR. So this turned out to be a very useful approach uh, to us, and with June's uh, very strong background in sickle analysis, we were able to do 
uh, a whole bunch of uh, really interesting experiments. So one set of experiments we did that I'd like to emphasize because I think it gives us a lot of insight into the problem I was talking about, lots of independent joint control, is what the brain does during reaching under three conditions. One condition, arm fully supported, reaching as fast as you can to a target. Condition number two, arm floating, reach as fast as you can to that same target. Condition number three, lift up 25% of your max, and again, reach as fast as you can to the target. So how did the kinematics look? Well, you see control subtext, table, floating, lifting up 25% of max, starting position, target. This is an average of about 14 individuals. And you can see controls can get there in all three conditions, not a problem. Individuals with stroke actually can get there as long as the arm is fully supported. But even floating, you see less. And lifting up at 25% of max, it could barely leave the starting position. Okay? So why didn't they do better here? Because biomechanically, you would say, well, there's not a difference whether they're supported on the table or whether they are um, uh, floating. Well, the difference may be if they do a ballistic arm motion and try to, to, to drive the extensors a lot, but what is it that they're going to do? They'll couple it by doing this adduction, which we don't want them to do. So they probably drive their abductors a bit anyways to avoid that extensor pattern from happening. So as a result, you get a reduction in reaching distance as well. So kind of the same deterioration I showed you before, but instead of looking at area measure, I'll give you basically reduction in reaching distance as a result of the shoulder abduction loading. What happens now at the level of the brain? That's the interesting question. And what I'm going to show you next is the most impaired subject we saw lifting up at 25 cent of max. And the brains you're going to be seeing left is left and right is right, so there's no flipping of this. And you'll see a whole bunch of brains going from early preparation all the way into the execution of the ballistic arm motion to the target right ahead of the individual. So I'm going to tell you that the person moved their left arm, that was the predic arm. It's about 300 milliseconds prior to onset of the movement. Just to orient you, whatever is dark blue are the areas of interest, sensory motor cortices. We're going on in time here. The more red you are, the greater the amount of uh, micrograms per millimeter square using a Loretta uh, approach uh, for the inverse solutions to solve that. And you can see that the activity from early preparation all the way into execution happens over the left hemisphere, whereas the person is moving their left arm. Okay? You or me, I would expect the activity to be in the opposite hemisphere. But in them, from early preparation on all the way through execution, everything happens at the 25% shoulder abduction, most impaired individual exclusively in the non-affected hemisphere. Okay. Good. Um, what do the group results show? So here we did the later laterality index, a ratio type index, where if you have one, you have all counterlateral. If you have equal bilateral activation, you get zero. If it's all ipsilateral activity, you'll get a minus one. And you or me, being on the table, floating, or lifting up 25% of max, the dark blue bars show we use predominantly, or more so, I should say, the counterlateral than the ipsilateral hemisphere. But what we saw in stroke, and that's probably the best thing that, that I've ever gotten in my research, when I saw Albert uh, with these results, like, wow, this is cool. When the arm is supported, they drive it, like you and I do, more so with the counterlateral hemisphere. But as you make the limb heavier, they switch over to the use of the ipsilateral or counterlesional hem hemisphere. So start to use resources somehow from their non lesion hemisphere. And more interestingly is the more impaired the person, the more quickly they tend to switch over. So a person that's not so impaired would have to generate a much greater abdu abduction moment before you would see that switch occurring. Okay. So how does this work? A little bit of anatomy here. So you can have a stroke. A lot of strokes uh, are white matter strokes. Some of them are hemorrhagic and may take out a part of cortex as well. But either way, whether you, you kill the, the stem or the flower, the results are the same. You reduce a lot of cortico uh, bulbar and cortico spinal projection as a result of a stroke at the lesion side. So what we think is happening is that you lose a lot, but you don't lose everything. So basically, if you are on the table, you may have enough resources left from the lesion hemisphere to drive it more so like you and I do. But as you lift the, more of the weight of the limb and as you have to drive the shoulder abductors more, you run out of resources and you start to use the ipsilateral hemisphere from where you have no direct projections. You can only drive that 
via brainstem pathway. And we think that the, a very good candidate for this is the reticulospinal pathway. Why do we think that? Well, some work done by John Buford, the PTPSD who does a lot of work in, in, in monkeys, has shown that if you stimulate the reticular formation at the ipsilateral side, you get flexor activation, which is exactly what we see in stroke. So we, th we think that this, this form of plasticity is, I could almost call it maladaptive. Yes, it allows you to generate bigger moments at the shoulder, but it becomes, comes at the price of independent joint control because you don't just drive the shoulder abductors using these much more, much uh, richer branching mechanisms or branching uh, patterns of the reticulospinal system. You also activate elbow and wrist and finger flexes at the same time. So it's really not very helpful to you. So yeah, it gets stronger, but you can do less. So any evidence for this in the imaging realm? And uh, I'm really fortunate to uh, work with uh, Carson Ingo, who is uh, a biomedical engineer who has done a lot of work in structural imaging and diffusivity type measures. And we have looked at basically uh, pathways uh, like reticulospinal pathways, uh, rubrospinal pathways, uh, and, and so on, particularly looking at the contralesional side and see if things would, would actually change. And what we found, to uh, our amazement, is that people that are really impaired and that are basically from the moment to do anything, they lift their arm, they are in this pattern, their structural integrity measured with a fractional uh, anosotropy measure, an FA measure, actually goes up compared to people that are less impaired. So they use these, these backup systems to, the, to an extent that uh, it's, it's borderline more than, than the integrity that you and I have. So we have some structural evidence that indeed this is a backup system that are uh, more impaired stroke subjects are in, uh, actually using. We also found that if we look at, at uh, synergy measures with the integrity that uh, basically the, um, the, the, the lower the integrity at the contralesional side, the better the person was doing. That means if integrity was increasing, this became the backup system and the impairment was actually greater. So it's a direct link between integrity improvements at the non-lesion side and impairment. Okay, both for the overall synergy, for hand impairment, as well as uh, arm impairments. Actually, there's a mistake. So, so arm and hand impairments were measured uh, separately. So this is kind of a dire story, I'm telling you. Backup system doesn't work well. Does it mean that we can actually change the system, or are we really in, in pretty bad shape? And is this, is, is, is this all we're going to get? So what I'm going to show you now is some work done by Mike Ellis. Mike is a, a DPT uh, who is a phenomenal writer, phenomenal statistician, loves to play with robots and has been running a lot of clinical trials. And one of the trials he started with now a couple of years ago, uh, 2009, is a trial where basically folks would move to one of five directions. And what we did, based on what I showed you before, is make the limb uh, of such a weight that each individual could only move half of the distance. Okay? Then we would train them three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, uh, and see if they could move more than that 50%. And if over time, they could do consistently 80% of the distance, only then would we make the arm heavier. So no clinician coming in and saying, I'm an expert in stroke and I think you're ready. Now it's based on a quantitative metric. Okay? So again, increase abduction loading as they explore their workspace. Okay? And then before and after this intervention, we used the work area measurement that you're familiar with, remember? Where the work area gets smaller as you make the limb heavier. And this is our average result, not our best result. So here you see an individual's work area getting smaller from table to two times limb weight. After the intervention, you get a significant improvement in the work area in these individuals. So much so that the minimum improvement is that of an eight by 11 piece of paper. Okay, that's the minimum improvement we got. And these are moderate to severely impaired individual. That means there is somehow a resource that you can tap into that allows you to, uh, to do so. Well. We also looked, uh, well, this is the group results. Here you can see the work areas before and in, gr in, in, in gray, the gray bars, the work areas after the intervention. Mike would often work only up to limb weight, but would get improvements up to one three quarter limb weight. So there was even an, an, a positive effect to, to greater loads uh, at the level of the shoulder. Yet strength did not change between before and after the intervention. So it's not like they were out-muscling this. Somehow they do things differently with uh, what they still 
were able to uh, get to at the level of their nervous system, and it was not just outmuscling the muscle synergies. Something else I can tell you now, which is a study that, is, uh, well, I didn't write it here now in the previous slide I did, just came out 2018, so very recently, is Mike did the same type of reaching behavior, but we asked the question, well, if you now resist them during the reach, may that give you some strengthening advantage anyway? So we had like a viscous field, so the faster you move, the greater resistance you get in the horizontal plane. And at the same time, both groups would have an increase in abduction loading, but only one group would get the viscous loading during the reaching. And what we found out that both groups improved equally. So the resistive work did indeed result in strengthening versus no strengthening in the one that did not get resistance in the horizontal plane. But both groups improved equally in their reaching abilities. Okay? Um, another thing that he found that looking back three months later, both groups still had the positive effect of the intervention, which is great news. And the only difference between the two groups is that the group that had the increased strengthening because they were working against these viscous loads during the reach lost their strengthening advantage, but at the same time still preserved the reaching uh, improvements. So strengthening is not the solution. It's a smart use of mechanics to, to uh, increase the, uh, the, the, the workspace using basically abduction loading uh, changes. So here you can see uh, the experimental group. We had a control group. Control groups in the earlier experiments, we did not increase abduction loading. And you can see only the group where increased abduction loading had a substantial increase in, in work area. So what's happening at the brain? How does this all work? Well, single subject data, we actually are in the process of, of publishing this on a larger number of uh, participants. And you can see the single subjects here in the red bars made improvements in work area versus the black bar before the intervention. So let's quickly look at, at the brain of a person lifting up their arm at 25% of max or flexing their elbow at 25% of max, left arm lifting up at 25% uh, of max, nice contralateral activation in M1. However, flexing the elbow, you get again this bilateral activity, not unlike what we showed with the, with the laterality index. After the intervention, you can see the activity of the shoulder going more to the center of the brain and elbow flexion is indeed shown now nicely at the contralateral side. So did I recreate pathways in this eight week period? No, but what I did do is have folks go back and use remaining resources from the lesion hemisphere more effectively. That is where we think this improvement comes from. Okay, and then the good question is, and this is philosophical right now, why is it? Why don't they do this? Why don't they use these remaining resources? And I think, and I had some discussion with Matt about this yesterday as well, I think the reason for it is that if, if you have had a stroke, you kill a lot of cells, cells are made of protein, protein are hydrophilic, so you get what we call brain edema, swelling on the brain. But that usually resolves itself in a matter of hours uh, to days. So once the swelling is gone, you may have a lot more resources than you thought. But what do you do after stroke? You're forced to move the arm anyways, and you'll already switch over to the other side. So it becomes a learned behavior. So this is purely hand-waving on my part, I have no, no uh, uh, quantitative uh, evidence for that, but I think that may be a reason as to why these things happen. So it's one of the things we're trying to do now in much more acute work is see if we can prevent that switch from happening in the first place. That's really where we want to go, using a lot of really good quantitative tools, engineering tools, uh, to, to help us uh, do this effectively. FES-wise, we have done uh, uh, some work, but I think in collaboration with, uh, with Case, we can do a lot more. Uh, this is uh, great work done by June, who has been looking basically at uh, EMG-driven FES of particularly wrist and finger extensors, because that's where things are definitely gone. You saw in the most impaired individuals that just cannot open their hand. And so basically um, what June has done is used um, a, a coherence-based filter to be able to separate what type of signals you get that are directly coming from cortex versus signals that get there via the brainstem. And if you do coherence analysis um, between uh, uh, EEG and EMG, one thing that you, for instance, learn is that you tend to go to much lower frequencies, lower, well, upper alpha band as opposed to beta band in individuals with stroke, okay? Whereas um, uh, you and I will use a lot more beta band. So you lose beta band. And so what we're trying to do is use some interesting novel coherence filters to still, still pick up the beta band activation and try to throw away the alpha band stuff that comes in from the synergy. And the reason why we have these lower frequencies is it's driven via a multisynaptic system from cortex, brainstem, 
2 muscle, so basically your frequency, um, um, uh, uh, the frequency windows are switching to the lower frequencies compared to you and I. Okay, so it's a really nice way to, to separate these out, and doing that, she has been able to get uh, results of uh, around 90% uh, uh, detection rate of when people want to open their hand and then help them do so with FES. So she's really built some really interesting coherent base filters. Uh, and as you can see, folks learn and tend to do really, really well, and tend to, after two to five sessions, get to about 90% success rate in us being able to detect their their, their, their um, interest or uh, their intention, I should say, to open the hand. I want to say a little bit about other um, uh, type of, uh, of um, I think we're doing okay with time, I'm just quickly checking. What happens about the spasticity story? I put a lot of emphasis on the synergy story, but how does spasticity play a role? Any of you working with clinicians, you hear the word spasticity all the time, but what role does it actually play during movement? So this is work done by Jacob McPherson with the help of uh, quite a number of them, also Arn Ostina, great roboticist, who, uh, who left academia unfortunately and went uh, to industry, so a bit of a loss, I think, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Arna was part of this as well. And so what we wanted to do is, what is the interface between this loss of independent joint control and hyperactive stress reflexes, for in, in this case at the elbow? So here you have the haptic master, and what Arno did is add a little actuator here with uh, basically a cable-driven, a drum right on top of the, uh, uh, the, um, the JR3 load cell, and an extra actuator, that's again right over here, that drives flexion or extension at the elbow. So you can perturb the elbow as you are playing with dip different abduction levels as well. So this is uh, a game we, uh, we could play. So here you can, I'm just keeping it mostly to the elbow flexion extension, stretches up to 270 degrees per second in this particular example. And what do you observe? If you do that stretch in stroke septex, you see a lot of bicep activation, you see a nice elbow flexion torque, you do the same velocity of 270 degrees per second with us, relax, and you don't get a whole lot in able-bodied individuals, okay? You're, you're relaxed. Here you can see Young and age match controls, little activity, and you can see here 10 stroke septic, you can see activity in any of them. So. Good, so this is with the person relax. We always ask our, our participant to relax while we test these things. But what happens when you activate? Okay, because that's the real world. You're not gonna relax and then be very worried about hyperactive stretch reflex. Let's see what happens when you activate. So what Jacob did, he had people activate 15% of max, both in the predic limb or control subjects. And basically what we found, if looking at the, at the uh, elbow flexion torque is that control septex and stroke septex get pretty much the same response as once you pre-activate. So really what I think is happening in the case of specific quantification, the way that clinicians doing, doing it is looking at it under relaxed conditions and stroke septex are just not really relaxed. They're just activating the muscle to low levels. And therefore if you lengthen the muscle you get with your, stretch, with your 1A feedback to your motor neurons, you get a big response. Once you and I activate as well, we're leveling the playing fields between stroke septex and ourselves, the responses are pretty, pretty similar. It's not much of a difference. Good, well that's nice uh, story, but what happens during an actual behavior like a reaching motion that we talked about before? So this is something that M Mike uh, and I worked, uh, worked on with the help of a master student uh, from the University of Twente, the Netherlands. And so basically what we had folks do, again, reaching to the one target ahead of them and um, looking at EMGs all the way up to peak velocity. And we had a first window, which is about 25 milliseconds into the movement, which is the loop delay you get before you can see any EMG activity. And then we look at the EMG activity at the peak velocity when the flexors in this case are being lengthened at a, at a, at a great speed. And so we did that then with the arm supported, but also as we made the arm heavier. So basically going from zero to 50% of uh, shoulder abduction loading, max shoulder abduction loading for each individual. So normalized to max. And what we observed that as you make the limb heavier, your movement velocity actually went, became slower and slower. Why? Well, you drive more and more of your shoulder abductors, you drive more and more of your elbow flexors, so your actual reaching velocity goes down. So if you then look at the activity of EMG as you make the limb heavier, you can see that the biceps activity okay, gets bigger and bigger the more you lift up the arm. So 
So the more you lift up the arm, the greater the biceps activity. Look at the first 25 milliseconds, you're not going to see much of a difference. Why? Because there's no time for the signal to reach your motor neuron yet. And then we found out that the only time when we got a significant activation of biceps beyond what you see during the lifting or the, uh, you could call it, open loop portion of the reeds is at the 0%. When the arm is fully supported and they move the fastest, you'll see a bit, tiny bit of activation in the biceps. Any of these other levels, bicep activation was not significantly greater than uh, during the lifting or during the uh, first 25 milliseconds. It means that it really did not contribute to your inability to move. It was really the much greater activation of bicep synergy and do, do is that, that drives the whole behavior. So it's a really elegant experiment. We didn't do any perturbations. We just went back to EMG analysis under really well-controlled conditions and learned that only in an artificial condition, when you have an underdamped system, because your arm is kind of on, on this uh, low friction environment, that's the only time when the, the bicep EMG is contributing a little bit. And you go to to higher levels or to certain levels of shoulder abduction that really doesn't play a role anymore. Good. So we talked a bit about spasticity and came to the conclusion that spasticity really doesn't play that much of a, of a role during, during a reaching from what we can see so far. Um, what happens with regard to muscle? Now this is work done by Ben Pindamarki, who defended his PhD in, in December did a great job, and Ben's background is uh, mechanical engineering, and he's also one of our dual degree students. So a couple of years ago, he got his doctoral degree, and now uh, defended his PhD in biomedical engineering. He was co-advised by Wendy Murray and myself, and Wendy bro brought in a lot of the musculoskeletal modeling, and I brought more of the, uh, the neuroscience, motor control uh, side of things. So what Ben did, in essence, is build this rig uh, with some help of Arno Stina, and it has basically uh, load cells built in that can measure torques at the wrist, and he had load cells built in for each of the individual fingers, and he would take three, three positions at the, uh, at the wrist, the flexed uh, neutral position and extended position at the wrist, and then at the MCP joint line, he would go with 15 degrees increments from really flexed all the way to really extended uh, conditions. And he would then look at the, the torques that you would measure at the MCP joint line. Okay. What he also did, because we were really concerned that subjects are not really relaxing, as I just told you, following a stroke, they have this hypertonicity, this constant drive to muscle, we were th considering doing nerve blocks to make certain that they were really relaxed. But that's you know, a lot of, lot of work, not easy, et cetera, definitely at the hand muscle. So what Ben came up with, Ben and I came up with, is, well, why don't we have subjects come in when they're really tired, ask them to uh, have a bit of a sh shorter night, and then come into the lab, show them a nice uh, uh, kind of uh, documentary of, uh, of the planet Earth, which is interesting in the beginning, but most of our subjects within five to ten minutes would fall asleep, and measure these torques. And he was like a hawk measuring all these EMGs, seeing if there's any EMG activity, uh, etc. And so what did Ben find? And these are moderate to severely impaired people that come to your lab like this, okay? I'm not, not joking. They're really, really clamped up, and we all think it's, you know, it's how we started. I was like, passive stiffnesses at the wrist and finger are going to go through the roof. It's going to be such a big difference in, in passive properties of these systems. So Ben did that. This is the, the regular condition. As you can see, no Botox is nine individuals in this particular sample. And you can see wrist extended, neutral wrist flex, then go through all these uh, different angles at the MCP joint line. And really what we well, found to our big surprise, there were no significant differences between the stroke hand and the, the contralateral hand. The specificenesses were pretty much the same, even in those folks that came in with a hand like this. Okay. However, because we, Ben started this before he did his DPT and we thought we had increases in passive stiffness, still we started to look more carefully at information about these individuals and we found out that, oh, wait a minute, some of these folks had Botox. Why don't we separate them out? So Botox, uh, botulinum toxin is used to temporarily paralyze the muscle in a way to kind of overcome this flexion uh, bias and clinicians use that and think this is, has a, a great clinical uh, benefit. So. We sort of folks that had Botox and did not did have Botox now for about four or five years ago, so the effect of Botox was gone. And lo and behold, in those individuals, we did get significant increases in passive stiffness. 
whereas not in the folks that did not have Botox. So this is really a kind of a big deal. And we found out, talking to Rick Lieber, that he actually had used Botox in animal models, and you know why? To increase the extracellular matrix, i.e. collagen deposition in, 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 in uh, muscles, in, in rodent uh, models, etc. So our clinicians are using Botox left and right, and yes, temporarily paralyze the muscle, but while doing so, we get some changes in muscle properties that we may not want to see. So definitely an issue. And so Ben had these torques, and he used a nice, uh, nice analytical model to then separate that out based on the fact that he had different uh, wrist angles and, and, and the finger changes in purely extrinsic finger muscle properties. And you can see that the finger muscle properties in Botox actually change, whereas in control, in, in, in non-predict uh, non muscles or in folks who had, didn't have Botox, it was, it was uh, pretty much the same. Okay? And that none of it came from single joint tissue. It was all extrinsic muscle related based on this muscle skeletal modeling uh, simulations. So to recap very quickly what we talked about, synergies, big deal, big problem with regard to extending and opening your hand. Um, in addition, you have indeed hyperactive stretch reflexes, but really it doesn't play much of a role um, uh, because of the fact that the synergies really drive things, slow things down to the point that even though you have a hyperactive stretch reflex, it doesn't affect you very much. And that muscle properties, contrary to what we were expecting when Ben started this, really didn't change very much at part of the limb where we expected the changes to be probably the most uh, significant. So a quick little switch because I've talked to folks about lower extremity. We do some lower extremity work as well. This is work done by Natalia Sanchez. This was a rig that we built uh, with the help of uh, Arno and, and uh, that Natalia put together. So here's a person sitting, you don't see this on a little bike uh, seat here, a round bike seat, so it's reasonably comfortable. And you have a six degree freedom load cell just above the knee and a six degree freedom load cell underneath your foot. So you have a total of eight degrees of freedom in which you can generate moments in the lower limb. You have 16 degrees that you can measure with two six degree freedom load cells. So we could solve the math and actually measure simultaneously hip, knee, and ankle moments. Okay? So we would convert things with Jacobians to, uh, to, uh, to joint torques at the ankle, hip, and knee. So this allowed us for the first time to start playing these games in the lower limb as well. So it really requires a set setup like this. It even has a linear actuator built in, so I can do this in standing position, but I can also flip the whole thing with a hinge joint into supine, so I can change vestibular input. All these things are possible as well. So it's a pretty unique device to look at coupling between joints. And so one paper we published, but I'm just going to show you this very quickly based on discussions you had with Ron and, and collaborators uh, yesterday. What happens if you do a dual task? So what happens um, when you ask a person, for instance, to extend their hip and at the same time abduct? Okay? So you and I, we can do this well, extend the hip 25, 50, 75 percent of max, and my abduction moments are maybe going a bit down, but they're still pretty darn good if this is my max I can do. So it's all normalized to individuals' maxes. Okay? If I look at the paretic limb, ask him to do 25%, the strokes of like 25% of max, max hip extension, what do I see? I don't see abduction, I see adduction. They start to scissor, even at only 25% of max, max hip extension. And that adduction moment uh, grows if you go from 25 to 75% of hip extension. So the more you extend the hip, the more you couple with adduction, you just cannot generate any net abduction. Why is this so important? Think about standing on your paretic limb or you and I standing on our, on, on our leg. We drive our extensors, we drive our abductors, so our pelvis stays nice and horizontal. They can do that, so they're very unstable standing on the predic limb, and hence falls towards the predic side are very common, and hip fractures in stroke as well. What we also found, which we had not expected, is that we even saw the signature happening to a, a lesser extent in the non predic leg. In the upper extremity, I can tell you there's really no synergy that I can measure in the non-affected upper limb. But in the lower limb, you can see there is some, there's already a significant reduction here at 25, and at 75% of hip extension, which is way more than you would do during regular stents and gait, by the way, but just, just for the signs of it, at 75% of hip extension, you see that they cannot generate a net abduction anymore either, whereas you and I clearly can do that well. Okay? So this is our first fury in doing this type of work. It's mostly in the frontal plane, but I have students now working on the satchel plane, which is much more treacherous. I don't need to 
I explained that to you as uh, good uh, engineers and that you have multi-joint muscles and that hip and knee flexion are really kind of coupled mechanically a lot as well. But still, you can use these dual tasks to see what you and I can do versus a person with stroke. So that's where we want to go with that. So we also understand more about the swing phase and the limitations in doing so in, in, in people with a stroke. So robotic-wise, well, we have the locomot. Locomot is great. You walk on it, you walk like Gary Colombo, the CEO of uh, Okoma, good buddy of mine, love this device. Don't forget, however, this was developed by Gary for people with complete uh, spinal cord injury. Okay, so that's true. PTs don't have to break their back to move the legs. But if you walk on this, you walk like Gary Colombo. Okay, it's literally set up for his, they tried to do an average gait pattern, didn't work, so they went to his gait pattern. He has a normal gait pattern, so that helps. So you don't walk, uh, so, but you can walk on this thing. If it's a position-controlled robot, you can fall asleep, you still work like Gary Colombo walks, okay? You still do the same thing. Pediatrics, I think there's more reason to use these technologies because skits may otherwise not be in a standing walking position, so there may be advantages there. But this is not particularly helpful in stroke. We see people come in with a major um, uh, gait, uh, circumduction, hip hike, they go into the treadmill, they walk like Gary Colombo, they go out half an hour later, they walk just like they, when they came in. And there's no surprise to that because there's nothing they need to do. The device does all the work for them. So where I think that lower extremity robotic needs to go is really a continuation of what Hermann von der Koy has done in Twente, where we have, like in the upper extremity, more admittance-controlled robotics. Okay, so here you see yours truly in this device. And uh, I'll show you a little bit. Uh, I'm walking on this, and basically the device goes along for the right. You have push-pull rods, et cetera. Actuators are all in the back here. So and I, and you'll see I'm going to make some small steps in a moment. I can just change my gait pattern, and the device goes along. So in a moment, I'll, you'll see me take much smaller steps. I can do all of that. Yeah, I feel the device some, but it gets to a large extent out of the way. This is much more interesting, I think, because if we understand what the deficit and lower extremity are, we could potentially resist or assist in certain parts of the gait cycle as opposed to pretty much uh, uh, dictating a particular gait pattern, which is what uh, the uh, locomot uh, does this day and age. So what are the conclusions of, uh, of uh, what I've told you uh, so far, uh, or the story uh, at this point, that devices and interventions we develop should be based on scientific understanding of mechanism during movement impairments following neural injury. Okay, these devices should be able to measure the deficits, but also be able to to be used as an intervention tool. And combined with video games, uh, for instance, uh, FES, similar thing. We need FES to facilitate particularly finger and wrist extensors, but we also need FES to inhibit flexors. This posture is basically meaning there is a constant flexor drive. Any FES you're gonna be using, you'll have to overcome that, that activation, which only gets worse if you lift up the limb based on what I've shown you. So being able to block Flexor activation is, I think, a crucial ingredient. And I think, I don't know of any other place in the world where this may potentially come to flourish and that we can actually do that. So yeah, we have had some interesting results in hand opening and things get better when you do this with this really smart little uh, EMG driven device that June put together really cool work. She got an, an R21 for it and it's likely got an R01 for this work as well. But still, we're not blocking, blocking the flexor activation. So opening the hand remains problematic. So I think there's a lot of cool work that will change the life of, of, of literally hundreds and thousands of people because about 68% of all strokes have, like, have these issues. It's a really large group of people. So developing neuroscience underpinned interventions is expected to result more effective and better rehabilitation results. Mike Ellis put in a big R01 uh, for, which, on which I think he'll do really, really well to start looking at these things really early on. Okay, do interventions earlier on, hoping that you don't switch over to the use of the non lesion hemisphere. And that scientific independent devices need to be simplified once you know what you're doing. So I always tell this joke, going to an ICOR meeting and having three individuals uh, showing their robotic devices, and uh, one uh, uh, really good mechanical engineer has a, has a five degree of freedom exoskeletal system of, of the upper limb, and I put my arm in, and it's like, yeah, that's pretty good. And the next guy's like, yeah, five is okay, but. I have a seven degree of freedom system. It's like, oh, it's cool. The hand is there and it bit the fingers and then the less guy, it sounds like a joke, but it truly happened. Less guy, I have a nine degree freedom system and I go in there, it feels really smooth. So I was like, oh, this is great. So what are you gonna do with this? Like, well, Jules, I was hoping you could tell me. 
<laughs> so that is really a bit of the problem here. So we have a lot of device development, but we don't use these robots and these engineering approaches in a really smart way to even understand what the problem is. We're doing simple Newtonian mechanics here, and looking at that and looking at the brain, I think that's the only way by us to get smart. And so really what we need is only one degree of freedom. I only need to be able to play with the abduction induction. The rest is what the stroke subjects can learn, relearn to do themselves. I don't need a complex exoskeletal device. It's a waste of, of, of time. I've done this, and we have done it with the most impaired individuals, and they can regain the reaching. Hence, it's a different story. That's where we'll definitely need your help. It's a, a much different, a more complex problem, but still, you need to know what you do proximally. And still, you need to do that in a really controlled environment to work out uh, the relationship between proximal drive and what happens more distally. So this is a lot of the folks. Here is Arno Stine. Here is uh, uh, Natalia Sanchez, who did the lower extremity work. Ana Maria Costa, who has been really crucial in all kinds of new device development. We have a passive, more passive version of the X3D that we're putting together, for which we uh, hope to get STTR funding. Um, basically, um, anybody else that has uh, Mike Ellis uh, right here, um, and uh, Jun Jiao, uh, Jun, uh, sorry, Yun Long, who has done the handwork that I showed you. So these are some of the folks uh, that uh, did the work that I, that, the hard work that I showed you. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge the funding agency. So thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you. I know that um, the you know, work you know, influences a lot of my work, and I think it's, it's something that we can definitely uh, build on between our students here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Dominique. How do you control for in all your how do you control all your patients for the location of the stroke? I mean, it varies significantly, right? So, yeah, so, so you can make conclusions over yeah. a large number of patients. So that's what every clinician says. Where's the location of the So What we have been learning with the new approach, I mean, I can go back to when I was a master's student in, 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 in biophysics, because in, uh, I did a, a bachelor's in PT and then a master's in biophysics in Brussels. And I had a buddy of mine who, in the this is now the 70s, did a lot of work on looking at holes in the brain and tried to link that to, to deficits. And that was not very clear. I think, what do you have a hole here, there, or there? The commonality of it is you lose corticofugal projections. Projections from cortex to brainstem, cortex to spinal cord. That's where it comes together. So looking at these deficivity measures, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, I think that's going to be a breakthrough. And not just the FA. I, the gentleman I was talking about is a really good modeler and has figured out that a lot of the fits we do are linear fits and actually the behaviors we're looking at are highly nonlinear. So he has come up with new ways, he called it complexity measures that have much le less variability than the FA measures and that allows us to look at that. And that now gives us a beautiful link to these quantitative peripheral measures I show you. So I think where the whole takes place is not that important as long as there are interruptions of cortical fugal projections the results are predictable base on those losses. So you can look further down, you have a little hole here, you look further down in the system, you take, for instance, a region in the internal capsule, you go further down in the, in the cerebral peduncle, you can look at the integrity between those two regions and you get an idea as to what you lost. That's the useful value, not the holes in the brain. Every neurologist keeps telling me, that's like, doesn't help you very much. We've tried this for 30, 40 years, it doesn't really bring us any further. So I think we have moved beyond that given new developments in imaging. Yeah, that, good question. <coughs> um, the question I have is, uh, so, the, so the idea that the brain's sort of ignoring these motor pathways that are still spared, the, I'm curious about what's the impact of these strokes on area 3A? Uh, so have you looked at the sort of the oh, appropriate- the sensory, the sensory story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised that you asked me this question. <laughs> 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 so actually, I'm going to go a little bit on a tangent here. I have a great mechanical engineer. I want to work, talk with you about this, actually. Great mechanical engineer working with me, Netat Gwari. Got a PhD in mechanical engineering from Johns Hopkins and has, has really become, is really a haptics robotics person. And so we've been asking questions about sensing as well. How does it change? And so we do position sensing with robotic using psycho, uh, physical measures, really nicely quantified, like reproduced joint angles, 
passively by the robot or actively by the individual. Similarly, with force generating abilities, you know what we found? What do subjects, what do clinicians do when they look at sensory losses? They compare between limbs. You know what we found when we looked within the paretic limb? Hard, hardly anything in most of these individuals. They did very well. So I'm not saying there are no losses, Paul. There probably are. But apparently with the, the type of sensory feedback you're getting, you still have a pretty good idea about your force generation as well as about your position sensing. Where you get the problem is once you compare between two sides. The active movement. movement sensation helps, Paul. So you get a better score in position sensing and force sensing when you activate yourself versus when, well, of course, when you generate forces, you do that automatically. But position sensing gets a bit better, and that's, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that, once you drive it versus once you do it passively. You see a slight improvement. But they did very well. You know, I'm not saying that, that there are no stroke septic without any sensory losses, but folks where, if I look at scans, I think they're, they're either their area 3A or their sensory pathways are nicked, they still do pretty well within the limb, where they have a problem is between limb. And I think it's much more of an issue of always initiating everything with your good arm and never updating your internal model of your affected arm. So it goes more into those areas. But it's actually something we'd love to talk to you about because it's really very different from what we were anticipating when we started this. Yeah. <coughs> Um, you showed that there was a, a restoration of the activity on the ipsy lesional side of the brain after you did the training. Mm -hmm. um, is that dependent on the severity of the stroke? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So in a way you have almost, and I'm just kind of hand waving a bit here, but you have kind of a sigmoidal function, right? So if you have major losses, you reach some plateau, you may not be able to do much. But the good news is you have this big area in between. So folks have massive losses, then you get into issues I've been discussing with Matt, of folks that have severe paresis, that can not do much at all anymore. They have like what we call a flaccid arm, right? But in between, you still have an area where you can make improvements. Uh, good to, me, to see you, Paul. Yep. Um, <laughs> I don't see him very often. So, <laughs> good, yeah. um, so, 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 uh, uh, so yes. There's going to be less of return on investment the greater the losses for sure. So I'm not going to stand here and say that but with our approach, we're going to solve the problems in the world. No. Are we going to be able to do much better than we do now because we're very specific? I have no doubt about that either. Okay. So that's the, and so we're not going to have people play Chopin on the piano unless Bob comes up with a really fancy stimulator. No, I'm, but, uh, I'm just asking, for those with <laughs> severe impairment, did you see a rever you know, yeah, reversing you still, the back you still, you still got a return to uh, more of so, because it's relative, right? You, you look at two hemispheres, you see more of an activation of the, of the uh, lesion side. But don't forget, our entrance requirements for anything is that they at least can do some lifting of the arm. Yeah. If they cannot do anything at all, right. then I have nothing that I yeah. can measure even, right? So keep that in mind, yeah. I'm gonna steal this real quick. So Jules, we've talked about this before, and I was just curious, your, your theory about the reticulospinal uh, tract, you know, taking over some of that plasticity. How do you think that fits in line with this phenomenon of the 70% recovery to potential? You know, you're familiar with this sort of trend that we're seeing. Do you think that 70% recovery potential is influenced by the reticulospinal tract or? Yeah, that, that's a bit harder to answer yeah. because don't forget a lot of that work was done with very qualitative metrics okay. like Fugel okay. Myers and so on and so on. So, so there's no physiological. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a bit harder. I think we want to repeat some of that but using much more quantitative metrics okay. uh, like reaching distances and yeah. well controlled environments early yeah. on. And one thing we for instance learned as a little aside is that Everybody following a stroke has their period of synergies, everybody, even those that fully recover, which goes into my argument that there's some swelling on the brain and you have less access to those circuits from the lesion hem hemisphere temporarily. Swelling goes away, their arm function pretty much returns. It's those that have had more significant losses then switch over and stay at that side. So the question then is, can we prevent more people from switching over early on? Definitely those that are in the more, more impaired range. Okay. So, you, you, so, so your, yeah, your question is, later, is a bit yeah. hard to answer because I have, uh, you know, have some some doubts about the the the, the lack of quantitative assessment of of yeah. a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious. I might have missed. How long does the switching take place? Both, you you want to hit early invention? Are you talking? Yeah, well, that's that's where we're, we're basically uh, uh, waiting to get funded to, to do that type of work. So. <laughs> 
So we have done a bit of work in the Netherlands. So the nice thing there is people go into a rehab um, and they stay there for, for three, uh, four months before they go home. So it's logistically much easier to do repeat measures where in the United States it's like 14 days, maybe three weeks if you're lucky, and then they go to day rehab. And so it becomes logistically harder to follow. So we do know that these things can happen very quickly and dissolve. Uh, very quickly. I was actually going to ask the other way is how long in the training is it a single session or multi how long before it comes back to the other side and then oh, so, so, so that's a really, really good question. Uh, we have been training 24 se uh, sessions total of eight weeks in chronic folks that are moderate to severe and we have seen things come back to the other side. Similar with June's FES interventions at the hand we have seen similar trends of going back to the uh, to the uh, uh, and then, to, to the intact side, and then through that process, uh, do you to see the it, lesion side, sorry. Do you see it sort of like jump over, or is it sort of slowly come over? What's that process? Yeah, that's like, uh, because, yeah, that's a bit hard to answer because we have some we have usually a, a measure in the beginning and a measure at the end. So these are all things that we need to explore. How quickly is it? How quickly can you come back? All really good questions. And then the last one I have with that is when you stop the intervention, when you stop doing mm -hmm. therapy, yep. how long does that well, does it maintain at least, for at least, at least uh, three months out? No they still you still have that. So that I can say. Um, anything else? Uh, you made me think of something else when you asked that uh, uh, question. Oh, something else that we are exploring, that, which I didn't have time to talk about, is to really come up with a proof of concept. We have been uh, using drug probes as well, drug probes that may potentially inhibit reticular spinal systems, for instance. And when we do that within a single, well, not a single treatment, but within a treatment of using a drug like tizinidine, for instance, which has a brain stem effect, we see uh, people improve as much, if not more, than with the physical intervention. So having a combination of drugs, FES, and physical robotic interventions, I think the type of mixture we'll be going to. Yeah. Yeah. Further questions? Well, I have one. Um, mm -hmm. Following up on what you were just talking about, um, the, you know, you, you see the benefits three months out. Are they given any special instructions? Use this hand more, no. use it at no. all? They're no. just no. in the wild. Nothing. Yeah. Oh. Nothing. Awesome. No, we we'll just, we'll just come back and we'll measure again and we'll see what happens. No. Hmm. No. No. So right. that, that, that we hadn't done that the first study, by the way, Matt. But the second study that is, is being published now, we actually, uh, Mike actually did a follow-up three months later and then found out that both groups, those with the viscous loading and the horizontal plane, and the group that also got the abduction loading increases, but without the fiscal loading, still had the benefits from the intervention. Right, the right. They lost, they lost the, 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 the muscle strength training. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but uh, the, the reaching uh, improvements remained. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. All right. Let's join me in thanking our speaker one more time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.